हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द ट्वेंटी थर्ड एपिसोड ऑफ आई एम बी पॉडकास्ट ब्रॉट टू यू बाय कम्युनिकेशन सेल एंड स्टूडेंट मीडिया सेल ऑफ आई एम बैंगलोर द न्यू पॉडकास्ट सीरीज एम्स टू बिकम अ प्लेटफॉर्म टू डिस्कस द लेटेस्ट बिजनेस इकोनॉमिक मैनेजमेंट एंड सोशल इश्यूज दैट मैटर द पॉडकास्ट वॉज विटनेस द आई एम बैंगलोर फ्रेटर्निटी इंक्लूडिंग बट नॉट लिमिटेड टू द फैकल्टी मेम्बर्स स्टूडेंट्स and alumni providing their insights and perspective to the topics and issues surrounding us for this episode we have professor pratik raj with us today welcome professor he was a part of the first episode of podcast series 3 years ago we had discussed the indian economy in the wake of covid 19 today we will be revisiting the discussion concerning the recovery of the economy post covid 19 so a uh, professor last time we had talked about a couple of challenges like reverse migration etc so and we the, the economy was dealing with that so what do you think about it are we on track or we could have done it better in some other way thank you for inviting me again to the podcast and this is a video podcast so congratulations for graduating to this um so it was 3 years ago when we did the last podcast when the world was in the middle of a very you know gr- gruesome and very uncertain kind of phase with covid-19 and uh, everybody wanted to understand how will things pan out in the future um there was a lot of disruption um looking back it seems to me that india has done reasonably well compared to the the state of affairs that might exist in other parts of the world uh we have not been having a crashing economy or inflation is not skyrocketing levels it's high but it's not very high uh we have leveraged the de- digital revolution very well uh one of the good ways we leveraged it was during vaccination where we were able to vaccinate a lot of people i mean the whole of the population and we took a lot of help of uh, digital technologies so i think uh in that sense we have been able to bring a lot of our capabilities and infrastructure together to make sure that things are not unstable however uh, covid has meant a uh, lost growth for us so we should have been a 5 trillion dollar economy by now in 2024 um had the trends of economic growth been what they were which were expected of us in the in the 2010s however um because of slowdown especially brought by covid uh, we are far away from that target so we can think of these years as lost years in that sense so there's a lot of catch up to do uh one of the reasons why this kind of slowdown matters is because while the economy slowed down young people's ages did not so young people still grew they still have dreams they still have aspirations but now those aspirations have been delayed by like 5 years so we have to kind of um think about it there's also a question of what kind of metrics we look at to assess the nature of eco- of our economy if we look at the stock market we are doing pretty well but stock markets can go up and down and they eventually would align with the fundamentals of the country and so we cannot rely on that very much similarly we talk a lot about these days about unicorns and startup founders again something to be happy about that we are building so many new startups and unicorns but again it's a shiny little object at the top on a cherry on the cake but we have to also know how is the cake like uh one of the issues that people have flagged especially economists about the indian economy lately is that inequality has grown and a lot more people probably went into poverty because of what happened during covid that is they had far more health expenses they had far more um emergency expenses they might have lost a job especially those who were part of an informal economy it was difficult for them we don't have a lot of good data to conclusively say how much there are some surveys which say that a lot of indians are, have gone under poverty the other surveys that contest this claim so we need more data to make that argument so 
what I'll say is that we can have some level of caution, cautious optimism where we have been able to overcome the worst possibilities and scenarios. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, we cannot get bedazzled by the stock market claims and the unicorn claims. And we have to go and talk to people on the ground about how they are doing, how are poor people doing, how are small businesses doing, for example. They have been hit hard based on many, many reports out there because of COVID. So cautious optimism would be my yeah so uh, you definitely put a very nice put it very nicely by balancing out like how it should not be glamoury and we should also look at the bottom level uh, of what you call laborer perspective so uh, coming to that there was this issue had been there for the entire world right like every country was going through this pandemic so uh, if if i i would ask you like how do you where do you look india to be in terms of the world like are we with the pace or, or so right now a lot of different uh, uh, you know banks and organizations have claimed that india is a source of stability for the global economy uh, because china has been a little bit out of picture uh, lately because of covid because also it has a maturing population so its economy has also slowed down so the fact that we are an economy which has good um, confidence of investors we have not been a struggling economy in that sense so we are definitely a source of strength for um, for the for the world and i like i do believe that we should think about it like that um, something that i would definitely like to point out that people should not forget that India was supposed to grow at 8% at this phase. Why is it so? Because we have a very young population. Because we have a very young population, it's like if we are clapping at a 5% growth, it's like somebody's a teenager and is barely growing. And we are still happy that, oh, the teenager is growing a little bit. When this is the only phase of a few years or decades when India can grow rapidly. This phase came for China before in the 2000s, 2010s, and now that spurt phase of China's growth has kind of slowed down, so it cannot grow as fast. But India has to. So, we sh so as somebody who studies economic development and economic history, for me, fast-paced economic growth is something that we were already anticipating for India, that it should be happening, and my view is that actually 5% economic growth is not good enough for us. We need to grow faster. We need to have a real economic growth of about 8% and ideally in double digits. And so we don't have any scope for celebration with things that I just said to you that we have been able to bring our digital technology together. We are a source of stabilization for the world. That's all good and nice, but 5% growth rate or 6% growth rate is not good enough for a country which is whose median age is about 27 years. Right. Uh, also, while while talking about the in general impact on econo COVID impact on, on economy, you mentioned about the job market, right? So we can see that there are a lot of issue with the job market now. Like there there were issues when the COVID was going on, but as we can see, there a lot of been layoffs has been done and uh, post COVID. So what do you think? Like, is this a COVID consequences or it is just normally the economy is falling down? Or something? So uh, there's always a bunch of people who are saying that there is going to be a recession. Uh, COVID definitely worsened the situation and the global economy is in a bad condition at this moment. The Russia-Ukraine war has not made it any better. Um, the withdrawal of the Chinese economy is also not that great for the global economy. So partly these layoffs and the downturn is a consequence of the broader global economy. Uh, there's another issue, however, that in the rest of the world, especially the Western world and the developed world, you have a lot of social safety net provided to people. So, for example, in the US, uh, the level of stimulus that every household received went in thousands of dollars. Nothing of that sort was provided in India. We can't also afford to provide that levels of support. But while there is a difficult economy 
global economy out there. It's also true that um, presence of a social safety net makes that downturn and those kinds of shocks far more um, tolerable for people. While in India, um, I looked at it, I think three years ago or so, that about half of the population relies on family and its personal networks for emergency funding. So if you have a loss of a job, if you have a, a medical emergency, you are completely on your knees. You cannot have any support from banks or you know, the government. You go and asking for help from your friends and family. Now that's very different from the rest of the world, at, at least the Western world and developed world. So while because of the global economy, uh, the state of jobs is not that great, great in India, but because we have not created the kind of social safety net that we should be creating, uh, the sting of that kind of a job loss is far more. And because we are a very young country, we have to be thinking about these questions also. These are not easy questions. Providing support to somebody who is unemployed means that somebody has to pay higher taxes and somebody has to provide a higher level of a welfare state. So you have to think through about how do we go, want to go about doing these things. But definitely we need a certain degree of uh, relook into how do we support those who are not employed and how can we bring them, skill them and bring them to the job market again, keeping in mind that India might be the engine of the world for the next decade or two. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, one, like I, I had this personal, uh, this thing about the job market you just said. So in that case, uh, there are ways that corporates are bringing in the new jobs. Like we are, so there's this one government scheme I came across where you register and then you definitely like you will be some training or some job would be given. So those are the initiatives that government are uh, bringing in. It's what I feel. So uh, can you like put some light on it? So innovation is always great. Trying to do new things. We have new technologies now. So using that technology to make sure that we have a better functioning job market. That somebody who can get a skill can be skilled and. Uh, given a job, that's fantastic. But technology alone or a new scheme alone cannot really solve fundamental problem of value creation and skilling that exists in the economy. We have to go back to the fundamentals. If you want to build an economy where people are skilled and skillful enough to be competitive to the rest of the world on a variety of parameters, what you have to also make sure is that you're investing in skilling and education. And from a variety of sources we know that India spends quite little on education and healthcare, both these two things. So our investment on social infrastructure is not up to the mark to what we should have at this stage of development. So uh, we need to really not focus on a new scheme or a new program or a new technology. This, this assumption that technology would, or mobile phones will somehow solve all the problems of the country that's not going to happen. Yes, they can aid in, just like, you know, just because a business school gets built, which is using the newest um, technologies of the world, it will not become I am Bangalore because of it. It has to invest in a certain degree of intellectual quality, uh, uh, capital, it has to invest in a certain degree of education, in certain kinds of culture to become an IMB. The same way, if you want to really skill young people in the country want to create a good job market, we have to really you know, give the money to support these kinds of skilling program. And not just that, we have to also think about making organizational changes. So for example, we have to ensure that ITIs in, across India, they actually function, that their culture is not that of lethargy. It, they are, proactive in understanding what are the demands of young people and what are they providing to them and the ability to and the agility to find new people with those skills so that they can impart those skills to others. So we need far more fundamental rethink in terms of both funding and culture to, to make sure that these schemes that are being put on the ground they can actually be effective. But in principle 
innovating new schemes is not a bad idea, but it should come along with sincere efforts to improve the organizational culture of organizations that implement them and to ensure that they are well funded. Okay. Uh, so one of the issues that you had also mentioned in the previous podcast was the reverse migration, which also impacted the jobs and the entire economy as well and the culture of jobs in general, I would say. So what do you think post COVID, how are we doing with the reverse migration and the migration side? So my understanding has been that, um, so what I'd probably discussed last time was that when we, that a lot of migrants are moving back, we're moving back at that time. And this could be an opportunity for states from where they come from, which is largely the Hindi heartland and the northeast of India, that this could be an opportunity for these economies to rekindle themselves and give themselves a new boost. I, I wonder how much of that is really happening. What seems to me is business as usual, that the engine of growth continues to be South India and West India. And those migrants who left for um, back for home, they have mostly returned back. And, uh, and some are probably not part of the workforce uh, because they are looking for some other opportunities or they are back to agriculture, for example. So I think that the Hindi heartland has probably not been able to tap that opportunity as well as it should have. Um, yeah, so that would be my view that we, but we understood the value of migrant workers as a consequence of this, um, of COVID when they had to go back and they returned back. So we understood that a lot of the economy in any part of the country is supported by migrant workers and we have to create some sort of a welfare scheme or program for them. Otherwise, let's say a migrant worker from Bihar comes to uh, Bangalore, they are not represented by anyone. Uh, they, are, they have their voter uh, lists in Bihar, yeah. um, so, but they are spending a lot of their time over here mm -hmm. and they are living in these small shanties and which in some sense leads to lower um, wages to them, which also means more efficient kind of uh, operations of all these kinds of gig economy, etc. However, or construction economy, However, we have to think through about the question that if an Indian moves to any other part of India, how are we going to make sure that they are well supported? And any part of the, of the country which would do this job well would attract good skilled migrants and uh, migrants who want to do well in their life. And that would really help their economy as well. So it's in the interest of the economies to support migrants in some way or the other, create some norms that their employers provide them with a higher degree of support than they usually have. Um, the reverse migration bit probably did not work out because you need to bring in a lot of things together. You need to bring investors together. You need to provide some skilling program together. You want to make, you have to ensure that um, there are proper living arrangements for these uh, migrants for, and you need skilled migrants also for an economy to start working. So it was a small window of opportunity which did not happen, but still I think, you know, we have time left where the Hindi heartland can come together and basically ensure that people who would go elsewhere looking for jobs, they can be retained. So, uh, like with this, I understand we majorly talked about the migrant workers, like the workforce, like as you rightly mentioned, Bihar and all those part of uh, India. Uh, but as my understanding goes, in India, migration also happens in the skilled and the organized sector as well, like for say IT jobs and everywhere. And uh, the, you also mentioned that uh, the, these migrants have returned back to their jobs or basically reverse migra migration has turned into migration now. So coming to that, uh, this, this uh, organized job market has come up with this remote uh, working model. And it, has, it is now, like till, till now, it was very much accepted in the organization, but recently we are uh, getting the news of companies calling the employees back. And, uh, and the workers, the employees are reluctant actually to go back to the uh, office. So what do you think? Does that help, like the work from home model help us? Or what are your thoughts about it? 
I follow some research on work from home and it seems to be um, sometimes, mostly I see positive things about work from home and the consequences of work from home. Sometimes I see some negative research on it. Uh, it seems to me that this is also a generational question that bosses are people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. They are accustomed to a certain kind of uh, lifestyle um, where work and home should be separate. In contrast, a uh, young generation may not, around the world, may not view things that way. So this could be partly just that, that once your generation becomes bosses, they would rather like to have a home workstation and work from there and um, implement those policies. And whenever required, you can have a meeting, um, you know, at a workplace. It's also about infrastructure. Let's say if, uh, off, if a company had bought an office space which and had spent a lot of money for it, they have to use it. Right. So sometimes maybe they, that could be one of the reasons why they are doing it. So, but in the future probably we will have systems where even huge companies will lease out temporarily uh, office rooms to do meetings and then leave. So there will be separate office spaces which will be subscription based, something of that kind. So we will have new business models to support this kind of uh, work from home culture. But it's a cultural issue also. It's also an issue of, uh, so there are other issues that also were brought up as part of during COVID. So a lot of people I remember, they started to talk about if productivity is so important, is it so important to be this productive all the time? Like because I think once upon a time the idea was one should be very efficient and one should be very productive at all time at the cost of their mental health or work-life balance. And COVID gave people a kind of reflection that there are many things to life. Uh, you can travel, you can do a lot of things. And being hyper productive may not be the only most important goal in life. Now, a generation of people may not be thinking like this. Mm -hmm. Even entire countries of people may not be thinking like this, but there are movements in um, Europe of four day weeks, right? Uh, work weeks. So, and they value taking vacation. They want their employees to not work more than five o'clock. Otherwise, they will reprimand you for a consequence. So I think um, younger generation would have to decide what kind of work, work culture they want for themselves. And it would be a collective decision. But I think Indians and Indian youngsters have an important role to play because work culture in India is not that good. And because work culture in India is not that good, the idea is that people should be squeezed for every hour and every minute that they can. And if collectively uh, those who are going to join the workforce sooner and people like you will be managers in um, you know, schools. So you'll be deciding how many hours to work and how much work you want because you will be the one responsible for efficiency and productivity. So you have to think about these questions and MBAs, young graduates have to decide this, what kind of culture they want. They want balance or they want efficiency and productivity. Keeping in mind that I think Indians are overworked compared to other countries. Yeah, uh, yeah. so there's a little, I don't agree to the one of your points here that you said that uh, at, after a point, like this is the culture that we have to build. So one thing, so I worked basically in both of the period, like work from office as well as work from home. and. Uh, the way I learned, the things I learned settling in with, within the mm. office was, I feel very, I, I feel it was very important yes. to learn a lot of things. So when we are talking about productivity and that at the end of the day adds to the economy of the company because that's how the job market and everything impacts the economy. So if an entire generation after a point of time just believes in work from home, so won't we be compromising on that value? Um. I don't think that we can ever have a complete work from home culture because there's a value of tacit learning that you cannot work. So for example, if you think about online classes that everybody had, nobody has a very fond memory of it, right? There's a value in informal interaction, socialization, uh, being in a classroom, sharing a space. 
So it will never be the case that we will be moving to a world where everything is Zoom call and there's nothing more than that. So I think what we have to do is we have to probably create a health, a balance that you don't have to be at workplace if you don't have to be. Just for merely for sitting mm -hmm. there, you shouldn't be there. But um, it should be a place which you probably want to go to and where you can learn new things. So the idea is that it gives us an opportunity to reimagine both a workplace as well as a home of what it is and how it implies. But because, for example, now I see that builders have started to change the way they are building residential housing, where they are providing these kinds of office spaces right. in those areas. So this is a shift that's probably going to happen where we are not going to move to from this extreme to the other extreme because as you point out it's very important to do tacit learning there's also the other issue that um, there's still a debate whether for example for uh, women work at home is a good or a bad thing for some it's liberating that now they can you don't have to be at work all the time so they can come back and you know um, do other things while for others it's a kind of a prison that they have to do everything and they can't go out. So, and I think that's what I meant when I said that, you know, that younger generations have to decide what they want and how much of it they want. And a new equilibrium will probably be built. But the current resistance to work from home may not be fully driven by economics or how much people like it, but merely by inertia that we want to go back to. Um, the era, the golden ages. Just because of, we are used to it. We, we, that's what it was supposed right. to be. But maybe everybody doesn't like that. Right. Okay. So, Professor, coming to the towards the end of the podcast, uh, the one last question. So, we know that there were a lot of issues because of COVID, but I, I assume there would be something good that must have happened, something additional or something, some advantage that we got maybe soft advantage or something. So anything that you think that uh, just worked out good because of COVID? For India, for, for India. young people, for, con uh, for the maybe, world? No, for, for uh, people of India, I would say. Um, I think that um, Indians probably learned the value of nature uh, post COVID a little bit more because they were not going towards the uh, you know the downtown they were a lot of them were going outside of the town so this possibly could lead to decongestion of cities where people start to value nature greenery hiking trekking staying away from concrete jungles and moving to real jungles water etc i think that could be a positive uh, I have no data or statistics to know how many people have actually started to value it. But to me, what I've, uh, when I moved to India after my PhD, I never thought that so many Indians would be so interested in nature and adventure sports, etc. And I can see this new emerging trend of these vanderlust people. And this is kind of an emerging culture. And I think that's a good culture because it, is pushing us towards a more balanced way of looking at um, the world. It also would ideally lead to more awareness for the environment. It would also mean healthier people, which would mean that our economy would have lesser pressures of healthcare. And uh, more generally, I think that it would also benefit remote economies. So an urban growth, a very urban centric growth means that you're only focusing on uh, the city and ignoring the rest. But now if, say, you are going to a more remote part of, uh, of Karnataka for a trek or something, you're creating new jobs. So in that sense, this vandalist culture, which probably emerged as a consequence or a little got a push because of COVID, was probably a good thing. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor, Thanks. for your time. And uh, we hope you got something out of this podcast. And we'll come back with more such interesting topics. Stay tuned until the next episode. Thank you.